everyone. First of all, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better because you're the students that are here paying to be here and taking time out of your lives to be here. I'd just like to know a little bit about who I'm talking to today. So I'm curious, how many of you by raising hands are from Utah? A few Utahns? Okay, great. And where's the other places people are from? Washington State? Washington State? Jersey. Jersey. All right. Great. That's super. How many of you currently are running your own business? I'm just curious how many entrepreneurs I've got here actually running their own business. Hey, excellent, several. And how many of you want to run your own business someday? Ooh, even more, great. And how many of you would like to run your own business but you don't have your idea, I haven't figured out what I want to do yet? Is there any of you like that out there? Yeah, there's a few of you, okay. Well, fun, that sounds great. We'll talk a little bit about those different realms and why I ask those questions. Another thing is, I believe in asking questions in life. I ask people a lot of questions when I'm trying to figure out business solutions. And so I encourage students in these settings to ask questions. In fact, I even bribe them. If you like Snickers, I reward people with questions with Snickers. Hey, they're great. So, and I, by the way, I don't believe there's any stupid question unless you ask it three times, get the same answer three times and keep asking. That might be a stupid question by then. But first time around, it's great. So ask questions, okay? I think it's awesome. You guys want to learn, you have specific things you want to know, we can cover them. All right, so Sarah told you a little bit about myself. I'll tell you a little bit more. I'm a country boy from a small town called Lakeshore, Utah. Anybody know where Lakeshore is? We have one? All right, where's Lakeshore? Hey, all right, that's excellent. You know where it's at. I grew up down there. Um, I mention that to you because I learned how to work in Lakeshore. I was a country boy, worked in the farms down there. It was great, and I loved it. So it taught me how to work, important principle. Um, also, I graduated from high school in Spanish Fork. Um, started my first business called Country Garbage. I was 21 when I started that company. And I mention that because I had worked fast food, and I'd done the Kentucky Fried Chicken thing. And I went to my dad one day and said, Dad, hey, I'd like to start a business, do something different. And he said, hey, have you ever thought about hauling garbage like you did when you were a Boy Scout? Because we did it for a fundraiser down there. And I said, well, sounds interesting. What do I got to do? And anyway, I started knocking on doors, um, borrowed my dad's truck, borrowed my FFA tr um, teacher's dump trailer, and started hauling garbage. That's how easy it was. And I really only had enough money to buy gas for the run that day, and I need to have that's about it, money for envelopes to collect. I just put envelopes in people's uh, mailboxes, which wasn't probably legal, but then they'd just mail me a check. It was great. Question. What do you mean by FFA? Sorry, FFA, it's Future Farmers of America. It was a class in high school. No problem. You said you were from Jersey, and there's no dumb question, so <laughs> no problem. Okay, um, so I mentioned that, country garbage. The other thing that was really cool about country garbage was help pay for my education. So I came to school here at UVU. I love this school, it's great. Um, I started back a long time ago and it was UVSC and I love it. So the neat thing was is I could work one um, Saturday a month in each one of my routes. I had three different routes and I was able to pay for my education here. So I left school from UVSC debt free. So that's one of the things I love about business. Um, the other thing was that I was making $30 to $50 an hour instead of making $8 an hour or $7 an hour, whatever it was, fast food. So that was really appealing as well. Now here's the best thing. I couldn't get a degree here. They didn't offer it at the time. So I transferred to BYU, got my business degree. And when I graduated BYU, I was still debt free. I didn't want to haul garbage anymore. I said I want to do something else. I had this idea I wanted to pursue, an entrepreneurial idea. And so I sold the business. Well, that's pretty cool, right? It's paying me along the way, and then I get to where I want to sell it. I sell it, and I get paid again. Not a bad gig. So that's another reason why I like business. It pays you along the way, and if you had run a good business, you can sell it and make money again. And then that gave me money to start Keystone Learning Systems. And Keystone Learning Systems came about because I was a sales guy for a technology company by BYU, and I was doing sales there part-time, going to school full-time, running garbage business on Saturdays. Yeah, I was busy, kind of like all of you. You're all super busy. And I was doing all that, and while I was selling software, I got the idea of Keystone Learning Systems. So I took the money from 
country garbage and started Keystone Learning Systems. I was there for 10 years. We grew the company from two partners to about 85 employees, multi-million dollar company selling software training around the world. So that was a really awesome company. I really had a great time with that one. Um, I mentioned I was selling software. I wanted to expound on that a little bit more. It was RSI. And the reason I wanted to expound on that is because when I decided to start Keystone, I'd finished school, I'm gonna start Keystone. And what was neat about RSI is it was a small company and I worked there while I was going to school. So I was able to see inside of a small company all the principles I was learning in business and operation. Because you get in a big company and you can't really, you see just kind of a niche part of the company. A small company, you get to see all the different pieces. You get to see sales and operations and billing and receivables and all the different pieces. And I got to picture all that and see how it all works. So that was another neat thing for me as I was able to learn business principles while they were paying me as an employee. And so if you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to learn from everybody else as much as you can be my recommendation. So I was learning while they were paying me, and it was a great gig for me. Oh, another thing I did that was kind of creative inside that company, as a salesman, I saw a need that wasn't being filled by the company. I went to the boss and said, hey, Hal, we ought to be doing this. And he says, it's not really our core competency. We're programmers. We develop software and stuff. I said, yeah, but it's a complimentary thing. Our customers are always wanting it. He said, if you really think it'll sell, you go ahead and buy the equipment, you do the, you do the business basically inside the company, and if it works, we'll buy it back from you. So I actually did that inside. I don't know what you call that when you're starting a business inside of a business. But anyway, I started that business, proved that the concept worked, and then he ended up buying and paying for all the equipment and buying me out of that business and made a part of this company. So that was a little thing I did inside of a business to help me get started on my entrepreneurial endeavors. Now, a lot of us are scared about starting our business because it's expensive, we have to have a lot of money, we need investors, whatever the different things are about why we don't start a company. Well, what was cool is, is there's a different option for you. There's multiple options, but this was the option I took. And um, while I was at RSI, I started developing Keystone Learning Systems on nights and weekends. Because now my business, my business for doing garbage is sold, I have my weekends free now. And I don't have nights busy because I'm not going to school. So then I started Keystone Learning Systems. So my partner and I, we started creating our business, our business plan, our first product line on nights and weekends so that we could pay our bills working during the day and get our business going. Once our business was going well enough, then we quit our regular jobs and went full time in our business. So that's just an alternative for you to consider to start your own company, okay? Makes it not quite as scary. All right, since then I've, um, Started a company called 123 Scrapbooking and 123 Genealogy. Um, I also started a community bank up in Banff area called Prime Alliance Bank. The bank's still going well. I'm a shareholder and the vice chairman of the board. Um, it's been really fun. I've enjoyed that. I also started a company called One Utah Homes, a construction company, and we built um, multifamily homes. We built single family homes and did that for several years. Um, had a partner with that. He's a great guy, and he was the the general contractor and I helped figure out a lot of the other pieces to make it work, the financing and help the sales and marketing, those kind of things. So that gives you a little bit of background about me. Um, I've been married for 26 years to Sherry Rippling or Argyle. I bring that up because if you want to be an entrepreneur, your spouse will affect that a lot, in my opinion, because some spouses are not entrepreneurial and not risk-taking. They grew up in a family where dad had a salary working for a government job, he was a school teacher, whatever, and was used to the paycheck coming in and et cetera, et cetera. So if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, just know that your spouse will affect some of that because they'll need to be supportive of uncertainty. Where's the next paycheck coming from? Or we have to pull money out of savings to make payroll this month. There's just different things that go on, that dynamic there. So if you want to be an entrepreneur and I would suggest you visit with your spouse about that and make sure they can deal with some uncertainty. Okay, question over here. Great. Yeah, so you mentioned like all these different businesses. How did that come about? Did you think I want to be a banker and I do that? Or did you see a problem in the workforce like you're speaking with here? Or how did that come about for you? Both of them, actually. So Keystone was a problem in the marketplace that I saw. And then I got some validation from other people doing it. And so I did it in a different area. So Keystone Learning Systems came about because I was doing training videos for the software company I was working for. And then 
the guy that I went to do the training videos with, the, guy we, the video guy we hired, told me about people doing training videos for WordPerfect and Novell and Lotus. And then I said, well, there's an opportunity. If they're doing well with it, then what about Microsoft? Nobody's doing Microsoft right now. Well, we're all going, that was crazy. Why wouldn't nobody be doing that? But that was back when things were getting started in the early 90s. So I saw a need in the marketplace and started filling it, okay? On the bank, I went to an advisor of mine that is a very brilliant person, has multiple companies, investment companies, sees different companies. And I asked him if he was gonna be involved in another company, what would it be? And he told me a, a bank or a factoring company. And I said, just normal bank, like Zion's bank? Or what do you think? And he says, no, it'd be a specialty bank doing niche business to business banking. And so I did the research and we got together and decided to start a bank. So great question. Other questions anybody has? I like the interaction, it's fun. Yes, up here. You talked about starting the business within the business. How did you, uh -huh. how did you like, you go to your boss and you're like, well, I have this idea, and he's like, yeah, it doesn't sound that great. Uh -huh. I fund it, and how did that make like, you feel, and did that keep your motivation up? Or it did because I knew there was a need because I'm talking to customers all day long and he's a programmer. He owns a company, he's a programmer, but he's not like me talking to customers every day. And so again, it's kind of had to put on my sales hat and go in and say, hey, that's how much I believe in it. And when you believe in something, sometimes you have to put your money where your mouth is. And so he said, you go put the money in to get the equipment and you get it going. And if it works, then I'll buy you out of it. And so you have to have a little bit of confidence. You have to take a little bit of risk, but it worked. That's another thing I was going to tell you guys. This was so fun. So. I had a salesperson once um, tell me that you had to place this ad. We were doing little tiny ads getting started in this magazine. You had to place this ad. Um, you had to change your ad from a quarter page ad to a full page ad in this magazine. Well, that's like going from $500 a, an issue to $2,000 issue or whatever it was. It was a huge jump. And she was saying, you should do it. And I'm like going, well, yeah, you're the salesperson. You're going to tell me that I should spend more money with your magazine, right? So then I said, you really believe this will work? She said, oh yeah, this is really, really going to work. I promise Glenn's going to work. And I go, well, if you're so confident in your product, you know it's going to work. She said it would, right? I said, I'll tell you what, have you go talk to your manager. You pay for the ad. I'll upgrade to the full page. I'll run the ad. And if it really works, I track them. If it really works, I'll pay your full rate for your ad. So I put the, I put the pressure back on them. Well, the cool thing was, is they took me up on it. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> they took me up on it and sales took off. She was absolutely right. And sales took off and we did a whole bunch of advertising with that magazine. It was so cool, but kind of the same concept of sometimes you have to put your money where your mouth is and she did and she ended up getting a great client of it. So super question. Okay, another hand is over here. I am so glad you asked that question because I've, I've had that challenge multiple times. You gotta, you gotta kind of what, research, ferret out, make sure there's a demand for the product. So on Keystone, for example, I heard about different competitors and then I started researching them and seeing where they're advertising, see, learn as much about it as I could that there really was a market for what they were doing. And then I went and filled the niche in another place they weren't because I didn't want to go head to head with them. When you're doing something that's brand new, like a new app or a new gadget or whatever, you just got to figure out how do I how do I find the customers and how do I really know they'll pay for it? That's what's kind of cool about Kickstarter. I assume most of you've heard about the whole crowdfunding thing. You put your product out there, you kind of get a gauge for how much interest there is in it because of what people fund it, right? So that's kind of a, a gauge, a, a way to see if somebody's really interested in what you're doing. Um, the biggest thing is, is will your customers pay for it? Can you get pre-orders? Right? When I was doing the garbage business, I went and knocked on doors, that simple. Knocked doors and said, hey, I see you got a burning barrel out here. Would you like me to haul it off for you? And you don't have to worry about it. And they said yes or no. And if they said yes, then the next thing was I pick it up, I haul it for a couple of months, then will they pay me for it? And if they don't send their check, then they don't value the service. So if you can get pre-orders, if you can get people actually put their money in, lots of people say, yeah, it's a great idea because they'll pat you on the back, say, you know, good luck with your entrepreneurial endeavors. 
and then you go spend a bunch of money and then you come back to them they go oh well i don't have the money or well, whatever so if you can try to get pre-orders do your research and homework okay i see another hand no okay great you guys are a great class wow i love this uh, let's see so we talked about spouse oh i'm father of four children proud of my kids i've got Son that's 24, so probably a lot of your ages in that range. And then I've got a daughter that's 22, son that's 18, going to Snow College, and a senior in high school at Sam Hills High. And love that. It's fun being a father and a parent. Um, some of my favorite organizations to give service to are UVU, Boy Scouts of America, BYU, and the LDS Church. Um, I'd encourage all of you guys to make time in your life to do service. I find a great charge out of giving service. And right now, you're receiving a lot of help through whatever means to get through school, whether it's parents, whether it's grants, whatever it is, you're getting help. We all receive from our community, and I think it's really important that we all give back to the community that helps us so much. And I just highly recommend that to all of you. You'll find a lot of joy in life as you give service. We covered a little bit about how much it costs to start a company. Um, Keystone Learning Systems, we started that company for, with right around $10,000 and some equipment. And so that wasn't too bad of a, a deal to start that and turn into a company that was doing millions in sales of revenue a year. And we basically had our customers funding our business. We were fortunate enough that we didn't have to take on investors. Um, our products sold really well and we had great margins and we just kept growing and kept putting the money back into the business. So that's another thing you'll have to decide as you grow your company how you want to do that. All right. One of the biggest fears I think we all have, this is just according to me, but I think fear is one of our biggest challenges in life and starting our own business as entrepreneurs. We fear failure. We fear ridicule by others. We fear other things. I don't know what all the fears are. Maybe you guys feeling transparent enough, you can share some fears you have about doing your own business. I'm just curious. Anybody willing to share your fear? <coughs> Nobody willing to share their fear for a Snickers? Come on. All right, we got one back here. Share your share. Um, I think one of the reasons why I actually don't want to start a business is just the, yeah, the fear of failure is basically that I dealt with those. Uh huh. Hold you back. Uh, yeah. Hold you back. Yeah, hey, makes sense. No problem. Back here. I see another hand. No, I didn't. Okay. Over here. Yes, sir. What do you fear? Uh, I think sometimes a lot of the businesses that I think of starting or doing, it's, it's not really the money that goes into them, but it's, it's, you know, what if it doesn't turn into what I want it to turn into, or do I have what it takes to actually, you know, see it through? I've done a lot of things halfway. I've got halfway through school, I've gotten halfway through a lot of things and, I, and, I, and sometimes I fear that I won't, I won't really have what it takes to see something through and it's, it's like, yeah, I think that that's probably okay. the biggest fear for me. Great. You had your hand up? Yeah. Which one are your fears? I mean, lack of financial security. Uh-huh. Don't want to start something and then just ruin yourself or... Go into debt so far you can't ever get out or... Yeah, that's a true great fear. Yeah, over here. Yeah. I think it's just getting started. Like I'll have the idea of wow, this would be a great thing to do or, or whatever. Um, but it's just a fear of well, how do I get people interested or what do I need to do? It's just all the things. How do I even get it started? I had the idea, but it's just fear of doing it. Okay. Well, I I truly believe fear is natural. Um, I've experienced fear many times in my life. I've had ridicule happen. I've even had people very close to me say it's never going to work. I had people tell me I couldn't make a bank work, I'd never get one started. Well, 10 years later, we're having our anniversary in December, and the bank is working, and the bank is actually having a great year this year. So I, I encourage you to look at your own individual fears and say, what can I do to overcome those fears so I can move forward and try things? For example, maybe I need to have a full-time job, so you've got that security, and they say, you know what, instead of relaxing at night and watch my favorite sitcom or whatever it is, you start your business on the side and you get it going, okay? I'll tell you, it's easier as you're younger, it's harder as you get older. So you get older, guess what you have? 
you have kids, you have other responsibilities with church or civic responsibilities, you have a mortgage, you have a lot more stuff. So one thing my dad told me that was so cool, he said, son, if you're gonna chase a buck, chase it while you're young. <laughs> so it was very true, it was very true, it was a lot easier. All right, so fear, guess what? There's some amazing, talented people in the world that we all um, admire. And I think they face fear quite regularly, and they fail quite regularly. So before you right now is some of the best ever baseball players our world's ever seen. And look at their batting averages right here, batting averages. The number one guy, guess how often he hits the ball? What does that tell us? Who's the baseball wizards in here? Three times out of 10. What does he miss seven times out of 10? He misses the ball. Seven times out of 10. How fast is that ball moving sometimes when a fastball comes across the plate? 100 miles an hour. Can that break something when it hits you? I would be scared. I'd be scared 100% of the time up there. <laughs> but these guys get up there they swing at those pitches, they miss seven times out of ten, but they still get up day in and day out, and they make it happen, right? They're overcoming their fear, they're facing their fear. Now look at this, because these best in the world athletes, I mean, you think about how good you have to be to be in that five list. I mean, these are millions of people, and they're this top list. Okay, now, because they do that, they get re rewarded quite well. Has anybody ever looked at how much they get paid? List of highest paid guys. This is salaries for 2013. Alex Rodriguez, $30 million. Pretty cool. Then you go down the list, and the lowest guy down here, dang, Derek Jeter only made $16 million. That's rough. <laughs> now let's look at earnings of a lifetime. Is that impressive? And he's still going. Alex is still going. He started in 94 and he's still going. I guess that's what the dash means. Anyway, pretty incredible, you guys. So hopefully you get my point. Figure out how to face your fears and go for it. Take some swings at the ball. You're going to miss. You're going to make mistakes as an entrepreneur. You're going to have some failure. You're going to lose money. I'll guarantee it. Now, I know there's a few entrepreneurs, and maybe there's a whole bunch of them, that have never lost money in business. I'm not going to tell you I'm one of them. I've had some great successes. Fortunately, I net out my successes and minus my failures, and I still got a positive number at the bottom line. I'm fortunate and grateful for that. However, I have had some great losses, and I'm not really proud of them. But on the other hand, I recognize what they, were, what they are, and I learn a lot from them. One of my recent failures is a pharmaceutical company called Gen X Meds. I spent six plus months on this company, had some great partners on it, very brilliant gentlemen, and loved working with them. We got it up and started. We had revenue, we had profits, we had a great business plan. Then we had some things come up that we just didn't expect, some challenges that we hadn't anticipated, and some contracts that weren't in place that I wished we would have had in place, and we ended up having to close the company down. And fortunately, I didn't lose any cash. We made enough that I got my money back, but I did lose the time and the opportunity cost. I didn't have a company that was running and worth a lot of money. Um, but I took a swing and a miss. That's okay, I missed. Now I'm gonna move on to my next thing, right? There's gonna be something else out there. Okay, so some ways to improve your chances of hitting the ball when it comes across the plate. One's education. I applaud all of you here getting education. I think listening to these entrepreneurs here all the time is very, very smart. Just got to do a quick time check. All right. So I want to add to your education a little bit. There's two books I really think you should read before you graduate school here. I don't even know if this might be required reading now. The E-Myth. Okay, this is a great book. Helps you understand the different pieces of a successful business and where you fit in your business. Okay. Recently, one of my favorite reads, I should have read a lot longer time ago, but I didn't. But anyway, I'm really liking the concepts in this book. 
As I read this book, I was going, aha, oh, aha. In fact, I highlighted the whole time of this book, and you can see I've got post-it notes too. I like to mark stuff. But this book here really helped me with involving the customer much earlier in my ideas. So some of you were saying some of your fear is, is how do I know the customers are going to like it, and will they pay for it, and that kind of stuff. Well, these guys say involve your customer much sooner in the process and clear down the road after you've already got a prototype done and lots of money invested. Get your, get your customers involved in the process. So I really love this book. Um, a couple of other things is that I would encourage you to find mentors. So for example, if you're wanting to get into a business, let's say you decide on the coolest new restaurant concept, find somebody that's been in the industry doing restaurants, doing something similar to what you have in mind, okay? And you'll be amazed at what people will teach you. So I went and talked to a local business guy once, and it was the coolest thing. He's one of my great friends today. I was just a young 24-year-old guy and he was a super successful entrepreneur and just great reputation in the community. I was scared to death, but I decided I'm gonna get a hold of him. So I networked in, found out how to get a hold of him, got a hold of him and said, Randall, is there any chance I can come meet with you and just ask you questions? I'm an aspiring entrepreneur. I'd like to learn from you and learn how to be successful in business. And he goes, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to meet with you. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I said, well, when will work for you? And I, just so you guys know, I'm kind of an early to bed kind of guy. Nine or ten is great time of night for me. He goes, yeah, I think I can fit you in. Let's do it on Wednesday night at 11 p.m. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> 11 p.m., I want to be awake. But anyway, so I wrote down all my questions, showed up at 11 p.m., and he talked to me clear till like 1 or 2 in the morning. Just I was asking questions. He was answering. Boom, 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 boom. It was so much fun. But I learned a ton about business, and he's been in the troops, you know, in the trenches, I mean, with the troops, figuring it out. So he helped me a ton. So I would encourage you to find mentors. You can have general business mentors, but if you can't, find one specific to your industry. So if you're going into software, find you a software mentor that knows how to make whatever kind of software you're doing, whether it's a SaaS model or if it's an app model or whatever it is. Find mentors that have been there, done that, and then they can help you miss some of those big old holes that they fell in and kind of broke their legs on. You can kind of skip all those because they'll help you and teach you. It's amazing. People want to help people. And entrepreneurs are very helpful, from at least from my experience. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, some other big keys in business is your, there's five different main areas of a business. And I make sure if you're putting, to, when you put together your business plan, Make sure you include these five main areas. So one is sales and marketing, all right? It's a key, key part. Another one is finance. I had another mentor taught me this. Um, Hal Wing, the founder of Wing Enterprises in Springville, Little Giant Ladders. You've probably heard of Little Giant Ladders. So I went and met with Hal Wing, and he taught me a lesson I'll never forget, and that is finance is the thread that weaves through every department of your company. And I got thinking about that going, that is so true. You got to really know where your finances are, know how they affect every part of your business because finance is key. It's a key thing. All right, operations, right? Once you sell a product, your salesman gets the deal done, then you got to deliver goods and services to the customer and meet that customer's expectations. So operations is very important. HR, really important. You got to take care of your employees, right? They're a pretty important part of your business. And then lastly is research and development. You got to research what customers are wanting, what their interests are, and what they want to um, get out of your product. So those five areas. Um, with that said, we're going to take a little diversion. I forgot about this. I have a quick question for you. And Sarah, will you come help me real quick? They're going to bolt these out. You're going to write them up there. In your guys' opinion, remember there's no right or wrong answer. I just want you to throw out what your opinion is. What's the number one asset in your business? People, so write people down for me, please, Sarah. Others? Yourself. Yourself. Great. You're the entrepreneur. You're the guy figuring it out, right? Next. Keep going. Brand. What? Your brand. Your brand. Super. Valuable asset. Others? The product. product. you got to have a product for your customers, right? Other things? Ideas. Ideas. Great. Other most valuable assets. Let's go for it. Top three most valuable assets to your business. What's your guys' opinion? Your business model, time you put into it, reputation, reputation. Marketing. marketing, property, property like your building. Yeah. Okay, that's an asset, right? Your building is. If it's a big skyscraper, it's real valuable. Okay, any others? 
This is a good list. Passion. Passion. Hmm. That's pretty new. I haven't heard passion before. Your value proposition? Yeah. All right, great. Okay, thank you. So, this is all opinion, right? But I'm just going to share my opinion with you. So, my opinion is your most valuable asset is your customers. Okay? The reason why I will put customers number one asset is because without a customer, you don't have a business. You can have a cool idea, you can have a cool product, but if nobody's buying and paying for it, you don't have a business. So in my opinion, customer's number one, number one asset. Number two is the HR part of your business plan is the people, because your employees take care of your customers. Perfect. So that's why I call employees your number two most valuable asset, because they're taking care of them. And then number three, I think, is your suppliers. And the reason why I say suppliers, because suppliers take care of employees and customers. So those are my most three, three most valuable assets in business. So that's just my opinion. Just some food for thought for you to consider, but ask yourself, what's the most important thing? Who am I taking care of? The cool thing about being an entrepreneur is you really don't have a boss per se, because you run your own business, right? You own the company, you run it. However, you still have a boss, that's the customer. Because the customer doesn't pay you, you don't have a job anymore. So to me, customer is very important. Yes? What are, what are some ways that you would have helped develop the culture in your business? Will people, will bring on more people? I'm glad you asked that question. That's another fun thing of you guys about starting your own company. You get to create the company culture. It becomes your baby. Isn't that fun? You get to make the culture. You get to decide if you can dress, dress casual, if you're going to dress in bow ties and tuxes, how are we going to dress? How are we going to treat family? How are we going to have Christmas parties? What are we going to do for Christmas parties? We had the funnest thing. We did company lunches on Fridays at one of my businesses. And then we did bowling for bucks. That was a great time. Company party at the bowling alley. We ran the whole bowling alley. And if you got a gutter ball, you got a buck. If you got a strike, you got 20 bucks. If you, I mean, we had all this stuff that the employees made up. Because you can find somebody in your team that's the kind of the fun person, right? And you can put that fun person in charge, and they come up with the funnest, craziest thing. So, yeah, you can make money for getting gutter balls, strikes, spares, the highest score, the lowest score, the whatever. And we just had a great time. You get to create the culture. So how do you create the culture? I would recommend you decide, well, I'm the leader. I'm going to be, I got to lead on this culture. And then you say, what are successful cultures like? What are the best companies in the world? What are they doing for their culture and their company? What do people like? And I ask people, I say, do you like working where you work? And they'll say yes or no. I'll say, well, what do you like about it? What's, what makes it fun? What makes it interesting? And then you can incorporate that into your culture if you like it. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Sweet. Back here. What's the most important thing you've learned from your failures? I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> and you guys, that's another thing. Education's a big deal. I'd encourage all of you to stay open-minded, always be willing to learn. As you get older, you get kind of set in your ways. And so you got to say, OK, I got to be willing to learn. I got to be humble, teachable. So that's, for me, it's, I still have a lot of things to learn. Great question. Other questions? Yes? Uh, going back to the company culture, what are some of the most like, memorable cultures you know, you were a part of or in your, your idea? Uh, some of my memorable things on culture. Well, we did a profit sharing plan that a lot of employees really liked. Um, I like to reward people for the wealth they create. And that's how I judge wealth is the profits of the company. And so if your company's profitable, then you share that with your employees. So we had a culture of bonuses and we had a thermometer or a gauge and we would be able to tell them where we're at for the month and it was posted through the whole company and people could see here's how we're doing profit wise. So it was kind of a way to be transparent about the books without sharing the whole books with everybody. So that was something we really like. Um, as I go back and talk to people about different cultures, they really like being social, they like the games, they like the company parties, Christmas parties, regular company parties, and the Friday lunch. People love that because then we just do a survey and say, employees, what would you guys like this week for lunch? And we'd do sub sandwiches or pizza or salads or whatever people wanted. And it was a time where employees could get together and they could all come together and mingle and get to know each other and be social. So they like that. So those are some thoughts for you. Okay. Cool. Oh, 
Marketing and sales, I forgot to tell you, there's a reason behind this candy bar. The reason behind this candy bar is, because I like to ask questions, learn from other people, right? Because how many millions of dollars has Mars Corporation spent on branding Snickers? A lot of millions, right? I can probably learn some things about marketing from Mars. They're pretty good at it. So I went to my favorite grocery store, Macy's in Spanish Fork, talked to the manager there and said, what's the number one selling candy bar? He said, Snickers by far. I said, really, Snickers? He goes, yep, that's the candy bar. I said, well, chances are most of the students of you will like my Snickers if it's the number one selling candy bar. Pretty simple to, um, calculation. And then I said, well, so you say by far. I said, what do you mean? He goes, they are like a long ways ahead of the next best selling candy bar. And he's talking about all candy bars. And the next one he told me was, I think, Milky Way, and it's done by Mars as well. And he said, an interesting side note, Clint, you remember the old almond, not almond, Mars bar. Is it Mars bar? I think it was a Mars bar, and he says they've rebranded it to be Snickers Almond. Anybody know about Snickers Almonds? I've never had them. Anyway, he said they rebranded one to become a Snickers Almond. He says now it's taking off through that rebranding process. So anyway. Somebody mentioned up here brand as being a valuable asset. It's a very valuable asset. So I just wanted to share that little thought with you to learn from other people's marketing and ask questions, okay? It doesn't hurt to ask questions. Man, time flies, you're having fun. Uh, okay, a few entrepreneurial rules that I would encourage you guys to follow. One is find a customer need and fill it. And of course, test to make sure they'll pay for it. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, are there enough customers in this industry to make money? Um, I learned in 123 Scrapbook and 123 Genealogy, it was only a certain size of the market. There was a need, but it was only a certain size, and I couldn't really grow the company bigger than that. I had a really smart businessman mentor once tell me, he won't get into an industry unless it's a billion dollar industry. He makes sure that it's big enough that he enters and gets in. He can grow and make a sizable company inside that industry. So that was his rule of thumb. Um, another one is make sure whatever business you get into, it's something that you can have fun. Somebody mentioned passion. I think passion got up on here maybe. Yeah, right there. If you have passion for something, most likely it's going to work because you're the driver. You're going to make it work because you're passionate about it. You're excited about it. You're going to have fun doing it. I would find something you're passionate about. Um, I thought it was interesting. A really wise man named Gordon B. Hinckley taught us to choose a career we enjoy. I've always believed that because you're going to spend a lot of hours. I don't know how many hours you're going to spend in your career. Eight, 10, 12 hours a day at your career. Five, six, hopefully not seven days a week, but a lot of days. So do something you're passionate about, you're excited about, you're interested, you like it. That's something I'd recommend. Partners, um, you may, I, I'm a co-founder with a lot of companies and I would work with partners that have common vision, common work ethic, Find ones also who complement your weaknesses and their strengths complement, I mean, you complement each other with your strengths and weaknesses, is what I'm trying to say. If you get partners where you both have the same exact strengths, I'll guarantee you're gonna butt heads because you're both gonna wanna be doing the marketing, you're both wanna be doing the finances, and then operations and HR is gonna really hurt, okay? So get things where you complement each other if you're gonna partner with people and make sure you round out your team through that. Um, hire good people to be on your team. It's a very key thing to success. You need to define what good people are to you. For me, I like honest people. I like people who are hardworking. I like people who are self-motivated. I like people who like to learn, because then I can teach them the job, and they learn it, and they can do the job. And I don't have to worry about them because they're self-motivated, so they're going to run it. I don't have to do a lot of managing. Okay? I can just turn them loose, and I let them get the job done. Tell them where they want to go and get there. Um, I mentioned good mentors. I'd also um, encourage you to get good experts. So don't get just an accountant or choose an accountant because they're your mother's friend and they do business finance on the side. I would get a business accountant, somebody that does business accounting. They have perspective of lots of different clients. They can give you insight and experience and thoughts on how to best run your business because they're business specific accountants and maybe even entrepreneurial specific. They work with entrepreneurs, okay? 
Um, also, you'll need a good business lawyer to help you put together your contracts and your agreements and those kinds of things, your policy manuals, da 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 da. Good lawyer will be something you'll want to have on your team. And then a financial advisor is good to have as well. Um, I'd encourage you, I mentioned I like to give service. I'd encourage you guys, and there's a really good book called The Richest Man in Babylon. And it's just a little paper book. It's great though, because in there it talks about paying yourself 10% and put it into investments, and it pays, says about paying 10% to charity. And it helps you keep your feet on the ground. So it's a good book. I'd also encourage you guys to live on less than you make. Live on 80%, 10% to charity, 10% to savings, pay yourself. It's a really good principle. Um, persistence pays, never, never give up. You're gonna need that as an entrepreneur. Communication's important. Have an attitude of gratitude's important. Um, be honest in your dealings with other people as you work with them. And when you're honest with others, they'll wanna be around you and work with you. So those are important things. We have a couple of more minutes, so I wanna cover other questions. Sometimes I'm talking real fast. I'm not connecting all the dots. What are things that didn't connect that I need to explain or do better for you here? Yes, ma'am. Do you have somebody you would like to give it to? Okay, there you go. <laughs> you said make sure your spouse is on board with um, uh -huh. what you're doing. How, how has your wife supported you? Extremely well. But you have to understand, my wife is a country girl from Idaho. So her dad was a rancher and farmer. So they got held out, frosted out, bloated out. <laughs> she was used to risk because her dad was a farmer and dealt with risk all the time. So that's helped a ton. And she's been super, super, super supportive. On the other hand, it was really scary when I had my sales job and I had proven through time that I could sell and get bonuses and commission checks and all that. And when I told her I was gonna quit that job and go start and keep running Keystone, that was a scary day. But eventually she got used to it and we've been able to do just fine. Okay, you're welcome. Do you have a question? Nope. Back here. Oh, excellent. So um, we had to find investors and we're an S Corp, so we sold stock and it took me and a lot of other people. I was an investor in it. I wanted to, I like to have skin in the game and be part of it. So I was one of the investors and then um, several other, uh, other investors came in and that's how we financed, we sold stock. Great question. Um, the founders, we took a lot of risk because we actually invested a lot of money to get it started and then once it was available to open for business and we had the FDIC insurance and all the rights with the UDFI and everything, then we were able to pull the money in and open the bank. So we had to take quite a bit of risk getting it open, several hundred thousands of dollars actually. Question? Um, Yeah, the bank was my first experience with dishing out the equity, and it's really structured in banking, so we had to follow a lot of the direction that they gave us with the rules in banking and the SEC and that kind of stuff. So that was more structured. There's a lot of different ways to skin that cat, and you'd probably want to get some advice from your eventual advent, financial advisor and your lawyer, your business lawyer, and they tell you how to do that. Okay, great question. Others? One, one more, do we have time for any more or are we done? Three minutes? <laughs> okay, one more. We actually have one location for our bank, but that was by design. The most profitable banks from our research in our niche were one location banks. And so, so as part of the you know, nailing the scale of growth, like, we always want to scale it as far as we can go. Obviously, that might be the only thing that that one, but do you feel like your success is Well, Stephen R. Covey said to plan with the end in mind, right? Or begin with the end in mind. So I would encourage you to do that, but you've got to adjust. As you're going through business, you guys, you can make great plans, 
And then you got to do what I've heard called zigzag. You have to jump from one thing to the other and you have to navigate. But I do think it's good to just say someday I want to either sell this through IPO or I'm going to sell it through a merger acquisition or I'm going to keep it as a lifestyle business or I'm just going to take dividends out of it. But you got to have that in mind. What's the end in mind for me and how do I want to do it? You guys might only have one chance. You might have 50, right? So don't get so married to your business that I'm only going to do one and that's it. You could end up having a whole bunch. You can see my career has been interesting. I've zigzagged and gone through lots of different industries and different things and tried different things. So that fits my personality, okay? It's a great book. Actually, my friend wrote it. <laughs> yeah, so um, thank you for listening. You guys are an amazing class. Your questions are great, and I hope you learned a few things that will help you in your career. Take care.